All right. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone who is not in Vancouver like me. Uh, welcome to our subscriber only conference call on MindGeek. My name is Alex Sagan and I'm the Vancouver correspondent for The Logic. We have Marty with us today. He is The Logic's Quebec correspondent. Neither. And I'll just Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll just note for you guys, um, I'm sure we're all very familiar with Zoom now that we're eight months into this pandemic, but there is a chat function at the bottom of your screen and a Q&A function. And we would encourage you to share any questions or comments that you have in there. I will do my best to multitask and look at those while we're chatting so that I can address or have Marty address any questions that you have. So for everyone, um, who doesn't know or who just needs a little bit of a refresher, Marty wrote this piece about MindGeek, which until I read it, I did not know was a company that is behind the biggest pornography production and distribution network on the planet. Um, and it is based right out of Montreal. So I think maybe if we can just start off with Marty, what got you interested in this company and what made you decide to pursue this story? Uh, it's fundamentally a Montreal company. Uh, the early sort of titles, like the, the idea of, you know, uh, uh, creating porn and, uh, uh, and you know, putting it online was born here by three guys that went to uh, Concordia University. Um, they started here uh, and the titles were eventually sold and then in a weird sort of in a weird sort of way that when the titles were sold again in 2012 2013 uh the the company actually moved back to montreal and is uh under the auspices of two guys that were working for the company before uh both of who are from montreal so that was the basically it was the idea that uh you know this is a fundamentally a montreal company and as luck would have it it's a it's a gigantic tech company uh, and I work for The Logic, which does reporting on, on tech. So I've always wanted to sort of look at it and say, like, here's the, here's the company that, you know, makes oodles and oodles of money, is Luxembourg-based, because probably for tax reasons, I don't know, uh, but has the majority of their staff here in Montreal. Uh, and it is sort of outperforms monetarily, I would argue, uh, much of the other sort of the much ballyhooed uh, tech uh, other tech companies that ha that are here that get a lot of press and it doesn't get very much press. So that was the, it was a, a straight up curiosity about this uh, very strange company that's been here for a long time. And you talked about this a little bit. It has this, um, this interesting history where it started in Montreal. It yep. was sold off, went to Europe for a bit and then was repatriated back here yeah. um by these two men do you, did you get any sense um were you able to talk to them and did you get any sense of sort of why they wanted to buy this company and bring it back here uh no i, I wasn't able to talk to them nobody's ever really talked to them uh you when you report on these guys it's ferris and and he's the the ceo and david tasilla who's the coo uh are the two main guys of the company you don't they they don't come up in the news very much they don't speak to media uh i mean i saw david tasilla once uh in a Porsche uh, <laughs> near my house. Uh, I, other than that, I haven't really, uh, never really talked to them. Why they would want to buy it uh, is probably the same reason as to why they want just to keep quiet. Is that, uh, I assume, again, I, I didn't talk to them, is that they uh, realized that the porn industry was extremely lucrative and that the way that uh, Fabian Thielman, who is the guy who bought the company uh, uh, from Montreal, brought it, out to, brought it back to Europe, the way that it was working under him, it almost became a data harvesting operation and that those two combined made it even more lucrative. So you can kind of understand why they would want to get into it because it is a money-making proposition for them. And so that's a really good segue into a question I had after reading the story, because as great a job as you did at, I think, explaining, you know, what the company is and what it does, I was still left with this overarching question of like, what exactly does MindGeek do? And can you, can you maybe touch on that a little bit and try and explain what it is that they do and how it is that they're involved in the porn industry? They're a tech company. And so basically everything they do 
is to uh, uh, accommodate the various titles that they own. So it's, so among them is Pornhub. Uh, there's YouPorn. There's RedTube. There's uh, Porn. There's GayTube. Uh, there, there, there's literally I think there's um, probably two no, just two dozen just under two dozen titles that they own. Uh, basically facilitating those titles to get pornography onto their site. Uh, they also own production companies uh, among the browsers and so where they produce their own stuff and and put it online uh, so essentially mindgeek is a in a way is a very unsexy sort of um, uh, what's the word almost like a back end <laughs> almost like a back end server to basically support all these titles um, and you know if you look at their their help wanted ads uh, you know, the request for employment, uh, employment ads, they're looking for, you know, data engineers, content formatters. They're looking for people that are typically looking for jobs in tech. Uh, and I'm told that they're paid quite well and, uh, they, they get a lot of that, uh, here in Montreal. Um, if you ask, if you ask them, they don't really like to answer what exactly they do. Um, you know, they, you, I, I talked to one of the main spokespeople there and uh, he sort of said that they're not a they're not a data company, but I mean, you go to the website and it says that they're a data company. So you know you, you can't really uh, completely uh, what's the word uh, rely on what their spokespeople are saying. Um, but all to say is they're ultimately they're they're a tech company. Let's that, that that's the that's the fundamental basis of it. And so we have a question from uh, one of our attendees who says, is there anything in their offerings that violate Canadian laws in your opinion? And I think this is a good opportunity too, to mm -hmm. touch on some of the things yeah. that have been a little controversial um, in their offerings lately. So maybe if you just want to talk about both those things. Uh, in terms of Canadian law, that's, that, is, that is a good question. Um, uh, you, so you'd be talking about hate speech and that kind of thing. That's a, that's a high bar in Canada. Uh, you could probably make the case in some of the stuff that I found, but again, I'm not a lawyer. I wouldn't be able to say that. But um, as far as I, the, the thing that, that I found interesting is less about the Canadian law aspect and more about uh, the terms of service of their various portals. For example, uh, you know, Pornhub has a, has a thing that says on there that they don't, will not, you know, the, you know, content involving racial, anything racist, uh, or, uh, isn't, isn't allowed on the site. Uh, RedTube says the same thing. A variety of their sites say the same thing. The company itself sort of, you know, uh, Pornhub, for example, you know, they support Black Lives Matter movement. They support progressive causes. They support, uh, International Women's Day. But if you go on their site and you just have to use a few keyword searches, you see that a lot of those, uh, uh, let's call them lofty progressive sort of ideas, are undermined by the stuff that you can find on their site. Um, it's uh, and it's it's really not very difficult to find the ones that I that I concentrated on for the purposes of the article, just because it's so it's so prevalent in the porn industry in general, uh, are. Uh, racial tropes, mostly involving uh, black men and white women. Um, and uh, it'll make paint peel, the stuff that you can see on there. And so I, I, I wrote down here I, um, the line the company gave you for some of the racist sexual tropes um, that, you, that you asked them about was, there's a fine line between racism and race play, which is a legitimate king. So I just want to get yeah. in um, the company line there, but also I, I believe you, you brought up a few examples of um, s some of these videos to them and they actually, they took them down, did they not? They, some that had used um, some derogatory language? Yeah, there was a racial slur. Uh, in, in one video I found on Pornhub, uh, was, a, was a blatant racial slur that had been on the site for a number of years and had something in the order of uh, 70,000 views. Um, and it was removed within, I would say, 45 minutes of me asking about it. And the spokesperson in question, a guy named Ian Andrews, thanked me for having brought it to his attention. Um, uh, after publishing the piece, I, I just, I don't know, I'm a masochist. I don't know what it is. But I decided to go to the other sites and try the same exercise. And I've, I mean, I found worse stuff on, a, on, on some of their other platforms. Um, 
I don't know why that is, if that's a factor of their moderation, their human moderation, concentrating mostly on their main brand, which is Pornhub, and as a, other brands have gone by the wayside. But suffice to say is that all their portals have similar terms of service, and the content that I found on them is, uh, uh, let's say, it's, it's blatantly against what they say in their own terms of service. And I think a, another good example of, of that that you mentioned in the story was the girls do porn activities of it if you want to just talk about that a little bit and get us up to date yeah so girls do porn was a, a company uh that was basically pitched itself you know amateur teen stuff uh that uh, began producing videos um and became quickly became a, a content partner with Pornhub uh it, the people behind the site were charged uh, and uh, in October, if I'm not mistaken, it's October. Fall, let's say let's say it's fall 2019. Basically, saying that, uh, and it was all outlined in the court documents that the women in question were basically, you know, promised modeling jobs by way of like, you know, Craigslist, uh, 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 Craigslist last saying like, you know, we have we have these modeling guests, please come and do this. They were brought in. They were coaxed with more money to do, uh, uh, you know, perform sexual acts on camera with the promise that, you know, these, these, uh, the, the film wasn't going to be put on the internet. It was going to be sent to Australia on a DVD, uh, that it was for one single client, et cetera, et cetera. What ended up happening was that, um, the women in question were indeed, the videos of the women in question were indeed put, brought onto Pornhub and the links to said videos were sent to their employers. They were sent to their, the women's friends, their social media comment, uh, 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 contacts, their parents, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in an effort, as the as the judge said, to make the stuff go viral. Um, Pornhub said that they took it all down in 2019, and there's so there's a couple of things about that. Um, first of all, I spoke spoke to a lawyer by the name of Brian uh, Brian Holm, who mentioned that uh, he had clients that were asking Pornhub to issuing takedown notices as early as 2015, essentially begging the company to take them down. Uh, they didn't come down. Uh, secondly, even though the company claimed that they took all the stuff down in 2019, uh, when, when these people were indicted, um, I was able to find short videos of many of the women, including one of Brian Lowe's, uh, uh, one of Brian Holmes, uh, clients on the site after I had talked to the, to the guy from Pornhub. Um, so it just sort of goes to show that, uh, what they were saying wasn't necessarily true. And the other interesting exercise that I did was I sent, I sent an evidence to, to uh, Mr. Andrews that the girls do porn stuff was still on the site and lo and behold, it disappeared within 45 minutes. So but before we get into um, sort of you serving as a human moderator for the company um, in <laughs> some ways, <laughs> yeah, we, we have a question that um, I'm hoping that you can address, which is, it, is the federal government of my Sorry. geek and what they're doing do you have do you have any sense um do you have any sense of the federal government is is looking at what they're doing or following this company in any way i mean they they're my geek is a very their modus operandi is to to basically operate uh under the radar not under the because that makes it sound nefarious and i don't think it's particularly nefarious like uh the way it's set up like basically if you go to the mind geek site um, there's no, there's no indication whatsoever that they run some of the biggest porn titles in the world. It's the, it's the tech company where, you know, you, you, you get, uh, they have parties for employees and it's a great place to work for tech, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what we're all uh, used to seeing. I mentioned that just because, uh, the, the disconnect between their brands and MindGeek itself is sort of structured in that it would, I don't necessarily know if the government would, would pick up on it necessarily. Um, if it was going to get caught up in anything, I think, I think the, the mind geeks up, the, the, everything behind it, the content and moderation or, or lack thereof, it's ubiquity, the size, et cetera, et cetera. It would get caught up in this sort of the similar kind of dragnet that we're seeing, uh, other social media or other tech companies going through. That is to say like YouTube and Facebook. Um, you have these terms of service out there. So are you, are you able to, are you able to adhere to them? And I don't necessarily know if the answer is yes. What do we know about MindGeek? Do they use human moderators? Um, 
how, how do they decide what can and can't? Yeah. Um, again, it's shrouded in mystery. Um, I asked, uh, so, so those to, to give a bit of context, there was one uh, clipping that I was able to find and it, find, and it was in a, an interview or it was a piece about mind geek uh, uh, written in glamor magazine. And in that glamor magazine, they make reference to 12 human moderators. So I was like, Oh, that's interesting for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's the one instance that I've ever been able to find that there was a mention of human moderators and, and the company. And also, you know, 12 human moderators for a site for let's just take Pornhub alone has something in the order of, uh, you know, 19 million videos on it seems kind of small. So I asked the company about it. I said, well, look, is it, is it true? Is it, is it, is this number true? They said, no, flat out. And I said, okay, well, how many uh, human moderators do they have? They said enough to basic, to uh, basically uh, okay. And um, approve every single upload that goes onto the site. Um, I don't know how many that is. I'm still in the dark about that. But the fact is, is that everything you see ostensibly from what, from what uh, Mr. Andrews said was that everything that you see on the site has been approved by uh, at least one set of human eyes. And, and how does that compare with some of the things that you, you found in the story? I mean, just yourself, you, those that ended up being taken. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, it was, uh, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. It was very, very easy to find the stuff. Um, so if, if indeed human moderators have seen everything, they have approved the stuff that I mentioned just before, um, which again, not, not to put words in their mouths, but I would argue that, uh, goes against the various terms of service of their, of their, of the many platforms, uh, Pornhub included. And can you just go over what is in some of Sorry, you, you washed out there, Alex. What are the things? Sorry, Alex, you, you washed out there a bit. Service. Um, are, are you able to hear me now? Uh, yeah, we can hear you better. Sorry, say it again. I'm just wondering what some of the things in the term of service are that, that they're supposed, that these human moderators are supposed to be looking out for. What should they be saying, no, this can't go up? Um, so just to, to give you an example, the red two terms, red two terms of service are that's the stuff that says it's, it's pretty broad based. Uh, so post any content depicting child pornography, rape, snuff, torture, death, violence, or incest, racial slurs, or hate speech. Um, I wasn't able to find, <laughs> I guess, uh, to the, to the, to the, to give credit to the moderators. I didn't find any of the, the earlier stuff. I did find, uh, examples of racial slur slurs, and I certainly found examples of hate speech um, on their site. And it's not like I I didn't do a deep dive into it. I was it was it was a matter of a few a few of a few uh, choice keywords. So you got some of these videos taken down um, within hours of making a request or, or pointing them out to the yeah. spokespeople. So, so when it comes to companies like MindGeek and you know other big tech companies, how much of a reliance is there on journalists and reporters mm -hmm. to point out problematic content? And, and what does that say about the ability to moderate what goes up on, on these sites? Uh, every uh, sort of internet platform with whom I've had uh, conversations, and I, I include MindGeek in this, uh, there seems to be a reliance on uh, citizens, regular citizens, people that are looking for this stuff, be they <laughs> quote unquote normal or if they, they're journalists to point it out to them. They've always mentioned, you know, it's, it's good that journalists point this stuff out to us. And I go, okay, that's, that's great that we pointed it out to you and that you, you did something about it, but I don't know how we're part of your business plan. Uh, if it's left up to us to, to sort of catch it, uh, there's a couple of things wrong with that is that it's inherently uh, piecemeal. I don't spend my day policing uh, various uh, social media platforms for violations of uh, terms of service, unless I'm writing about it. And secondly, uh, if you're depending on that to police your content, it sort of says something about the fact, uh, it sort of says something I think uh, about your 
uh, your trust and your ability to use your uh, human moderators to to snuff to sniff this stuff out. Um, it doesn't sound it much. It doesn't give me very much reassurance. Put it that way. And there's a phenomenal amount of content on these sites, right? We have we have a question um, right now about what the scale is of the content and how, how does it compare to something like YouTube? Uh, can you talk to that a little bit, uh, just sort of how much content there really is here? Uh, it's, it's massive. You know, they have 115 million people that visit their sites every day. Uh, Pornhub alone has something in the order of, it's, you know, 19 or 20 million uh, uploads on their site or pieces of content on their site. Uh, they get like, you know, 8 million things that come in a year. Uh, and it's, and it's interesting. That's part of their business model is that they're able to sort of see what people like and they're able to tailor their content, uh, appropriately. They do exactly, uh, there's, there was actually a paper written about it last year, pardon me, about, about it and how they basically do the exact same thing as Netflix does. Um, in fact, they're, they're arguably better at it than Netflix because, you know, while Netflix puts out what 180 or a hundred productions a year, they have exponentially more, uh, in terms of data points that just gets, uh, you know, uploaded and, and created by, by these sites. So they have a lot more data to work with. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, it's actually quite interesting uh, how they, uh, how they're able to do that. That comparison to Netflix can actually go back to the very beginning of the company, right? You you mentioned, um, I think, in the story that MindGeek started in a in a similar way that Netflix did, where initially um, the porn industry was very much DVD based. Can you just talk yep. about that comparison a little bit? Yeah. So that you know, the company started in the uh, early mid aughts, uh, and basically when they came on the scene, there was a little bit uh, of 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 internet. Uh, Porn. like it was it was it was on the internet uh it was <laughs> it was called you can even call it a pioneer in a way um but most of it most of its uh, uh distribution was still done by dvds that is to say you know you, you you buy a dvd either on a website or you'd go to a store to buy it and and that's how you and then you'd watch it at home or whatever um what these guys realized was that it was much much easier much faster that to do uh, to do that all via the internet, via, uh, via their own sites. Um, which again is exactly what Netflix did. Uh, but they did it like five, it, you know, these guys, and when I say that it's, it's the, the guys behind, uh, uh the company called Mansef and, uh, and the original Pornhub, they did it three, four years before Netflix even thought of it. They started when Netflix was still se selling, uh, sending out DVDs. Uh, by way of the mail and you were returning them. Um, so in a way they were, they sort of did what Netflix did uh, before Netflix even sort of thought of it or, or put that, put that part of their business plan into play. So we, we have another question um, that takes us back to sort of the problematic things that you found on this, on these sites. And someone's wondering whether it's possible that there is some child pornography buried um, on some of my geek sites somewhere. Uh, I, I have to preface it by saying that I myself did not find any. Uh, I've had screenshots sent to me uh, of what appears to be younger people on there. I, I personally didn't find any. The piece that I referenced in my column was, a, was, a, was an investigation done by the Sunday Times last year, uh, and they were able to find some. They specifically mention it in the story that they were able to find it. And again, they, they didn't, they said that it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, to the, to the question, to the, the question, the person asked the question to their point, it wasn't particularly e or difficult for the Sunday times reporters to find this stuff. Um, uh, so in answer to your question, I didn't, haven't seen any, but uh, yes, the, the other, yes, it, 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 other people have found it. Uh, the other thing I would add to that is that one of the most, uh, uh, what's the word? I guess popular search term or category or whatever is teens. So that it, it, it's and it's you know primarily uh, teenage women. And uh, while it's very possible that every model on there 
even if every model on there is, you know, of, of age of majority, 18 or whatever, um, they're made to look younger. Um, that poses, uh, obviously poses a, an ethical problem, but it also poses a problem for um, uh, software scanning for this kind of stuff, because how, how, can, how can an algorithm decide if a woman or, uh, or, or a person, uh, a woman or a man, is of the age of majority if they're specifically and and you know made to look younger than they than they really are. Um, it's one of the questions that I that I would like to get to eventually, uh, and that uh, uh, Mind Geek wasn't particularly forthcoming on. So I just want to jump back to um, that investigation that you cited in your piece, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think um, you had said that they found children as young as three years old there. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I just want to say that the company line on that or what they told you was that the existence of child pornography on their sites is a quote conspiracy theory. Yeah, they said they said that as suggesting as much was dabbling in conspiracy theories. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, I, and so yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah. I, so you, you started touching on this um, at the end of your answer, but someone's wondering whether the company um, is using Microsoft photo DNA and video DNA for tracking child sexual exploitation imagery like the big platforms do. Were, were, was the company at all responsive to those kinds of questions? Were you able to find anything they, out about that? They have used the, uh, they use digital fingerprinting. Yes, they, they, they say that they use it for sure. Um, the interesting thing to me, again, is, is just a matter of will. Like it comes to, to what happened to those, to those women on uh, on girls do porn, for example, if it, what was what was most shocking shocking to me, and we we talked a little bit about this yesterday, Alex, was the was the ease at which they can take stuff down. So in my in my case, you know, I'd ask about them, and it would literally it would be down in within within forty five minutes or an hour. It wasn't like they had to go through some large process to get this stuff taken off their sites. It it happened with the snap of a finger. It was there one moment, and it was gone the next. So. When you have uh, women, in, in the case of, uh, of Brian Holm, for example, the lawyer who represented 20, or one of the lawyers that represented 22 of these women, um, uh, you had these women literally begging the company, begging them, like, please take this down. It was done under false pretenses. I was told this was going to be a DVD in Australia or something. Uh, and it ended up, and my parents know about it and all this kind of thing, begging them. And they didn't do anything about it. That, that content wasn't taken down until like three or four years later. Um, so in a long way to answer the question is that they might have all the technology uh, and the ability to police their own software as they want. If there isn't a will to take stuff down, um, then I don't necessarily know if that's going to happen. Do you know what changed between the company saying it wouldn't take it down when the women were requesting that they do so and when they did decide to do so a couple years later? Was it because of the, the court system? Yeah, I think, I think, again, I didn't ask why they took it down when they did. It just so happened that they took it down when, when the men uh, behind the, the uh, Girls Do Porn site were indicted. Uh, it happened, uh, uh, you know, right around the same time. It might have even been the same day. Um, so I think that was what was that was. And, and, the, and the point that, that uh, Mr. Andrews made from, from, from Pornhub, and it's, I think it's actually a good one, is that, uh, you know, while that site, that, that content was taken down from Pornhub and, and, uh, and what have you, um, which was originally a content partner with them, there's other sites out there, non, uh, and it needs to be said, is it's non-Mind Geek owned sites where this content is still readily available. Um, and I say that because it basically means that this stuff is going to be online in perpetuity, no matter what Pornhub says, or no matter what Pornhub does, even if they took it down, it's going to be somewhere else. And that's the, that's the tragedy for me. Um, you know, I, I, I started reporting this and as a reporter, you were like, well, I got to talk to one of these women involved. And I sort of stopped in the middle of it. And I'm just like, I don't really need need to talk to this person. I don't want to have to bring this all back up. These are people who are trying to move on with their lives. And, uh, and, in, and in a certain way, they won't be able to because that's going to always going to be there. And that's the, that was the saddest part for me. And I, I think one of the things that stood out to me while reading your story, and I'll bring this up because, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic and it plays a role in every story and some, to some degree right now, um, 
COVID-19 has actually been really good for MindGeek's bottom line, right? And, yeah. and the porn industry itself has, has really been sort of benefiting from what's happening. Um, can you just talk about that a little bit and how the pandemic has, has lifted it even more? Even yeah, the the one thing that you can say about about Pornhub that's interesting uh, in certain sen- in certain senses they're they're almost more proactive in terms of, of of giving out data than than the Facebooks and the YouTubes of the world. <clears throat> when it I guess when when it makes them look good, but I mean if you look at their they have this site called Pornhub Insights, and you go on there and you can look at uh, how their how their viewership has gone up during the pandemic. Uh, so. Sometimes it was upwards of 23% uh, because of the pandemic. Um, the other thing that you can track is because they're a worldwide company and they have markets everywhere, you can actually watch the consumption of pornography going up as the wave traveled across. So, you know, it, it started in Europe and then it got, uh, went, up, went up in Europe. And then the same, we had the same sort of uh, uh, upward trend, you know, in Canada and the United States but only like like a week week and a half later or two weeks later when the when the pandemic landed here the other thing that the company has done is they've given out Pornhub premium for free uh which is normally a paid service i don't really know how much it is a year but uh maybe 100 bucks or something whatever it is they gave it out to people for free which you know sure it's very magnanimous of them and everything but it's a very very savvy thing on their part because you get these then you get uh anybody that wants to get people to pay for content knows hint into the logic uh, is that that you try to get people to interested in your product uh, and then uh, so interested that they'll eventually pay for it and you get to go in and look and take all the data that they're basically giving you for free um, so uh, that was their play uh, during uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic and so I, I just did a quick Google while uh, while you were talking there, and I believe it's nine ninety nine a month for uh, for the premium service. So that that would have been roughly a hundred a year that they offered up for free. That's not bad. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, you know, now that you've you've done this story, is this a, a company that you plan to to keep looking at? Is there anything else that you have in the works? Uh, do you plan to continue your coverage of this in any way? Uh, I can't not. Uh, Primarily because it is a very large technological concern here in Montreal, uh, uh, like it or not, regardless of how you feel about pornography, uh, it is a going concern in, in the tech industry, and as such, uh, warrants uh, a certain amount of attention. The other thing too is is in reporting some of this is that I was kind of I was kind of not not shocked, but I was surprised by how how little has been sort of written about them. Uh, almost on, on a local or a Canadian level. A lot of a lot of international titles have sort of touched on them. Not a whole lot uh, here within Canada. Uh, and uh, which was uh, which was quite telling for me, which is sort of another reason as to why I would like to continue uh, talking about them. Well, I know I'll definitely be keeping an eye out for uh, any of your future coverage on this. I learned a lot from your first story and I'm sure I'll keep learning more as you keep reporting on them. I think we'll we'll wrap it up there. Um, I want to thank Marty, of course, and everyone who joined to listen to this call. As always, we appreciate all of your support. And I'd just like to note that we always rely on word of mouth from our subscribers and our listeners. So if you want to share a story or a daily briefing with any of your friends or family, encourage them to subscribe. That would be great. Please keep an eye out for all of our upcoming conference calls. And a big thank you to Marty for this coverage, for taking the time to speak with us today. Amanda and Caroline and Jenna, our business team that put this call together um, and gave me the opportunity to chat with all of you today. So thanks so much, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks a lot, guys.